The coastlines of Haida Gwaii are a remote wonder. From endless sandy beaches to unimaginable wildlife, it is an island chain seemingly of another world. Cultural mysteries rooted in oral tradition. So I'm trying to piece together an oral history tradition with archaeology. Culinary secrets revealed through these coastlines. And we pretty much live off salmon, everything we pick up at low tide. And a Haida art legacy known throughout the world. Yeah, art is, has been a really uh, family tradition for many, many generations. Now, we reveal the coastlines like never before, unlocking the secrets of our maritime past, present, and future. Canada, over the edge. Haida Gwaii is an incredible offshore archipelago. Eighteen hundred and eighty-four islands covering more than ten thousand square kilometers. It is located off the western coastline of British Columbia and separated from Alaska by the waters of Dixon Entrance. The northern half of Haida Gwaii is dominated by Graham Island. Graham Island's northern marine perimeter is a barren natural wonder. 80 kilometers of rocky coastline, stretching from Langara Light Station to Rose Point. Just east of Langara Light Station, Pillar Bay is a tiny inlet along the waters of Dixon Entrance. It is home to Pillar Rock, a landmark here, formed over time as crashing waves and winds slowly eroded the headland surrounding, leaving behind this geological wonder. Pillar Rock measures eight meters in diameter and stands 30 meters tall. At high tide, Pillar Rock is surrounded by water. At low tide, it is fully revealed. Amazingly, trees and shrubbery line the top of this marine wonder. To the east, Masset Sound is a narrow waterway leading inland. It stretches more than 20 kilometers along remote, dense forests. To the northwest, 
Drizzle Lake Ecological Reserve lines the waters of Massett Sound. Established in 1973, the reserve measures 837 hectares, protected lakes and bogs stretching for kilometers. It is a remote inland feature of Haida Gwaii. Back to the coast, the villages of Masset and Old Masset are the first signs of civilization along this coast. Masset is the service hub for the region, home to nearly 1,000 people. Two kilometers northwest, Old Masset is built on the site of a traditional Haida village. Today, Haida tradition continues to thrive here through the work of artists like Christian White. Yeah, art is, has been a really uh, family tradition for many, many generations, uh, going back to uh, my great great grandparents. As we're growing up, we're really surrounded by the art watching our father create the art. So it was just a natural way to move, move into that direction. White is one of Haida Gwaii's foremost designers and carvers of totem poles. To carve a monumental red cedar pole, it takes a lot of uh, planning. Um, you know, first of all, you have to find the, the tree to carve it. And, uh, or maybe that, maybe sometimes the cedar finds you and uh, uh, you're chosen to carve it. So, you know, it might take a, a month of preparation before you even start to carve the pole. Uh, from the tree to the, to the, the totem pole form. Uh, and then you have to create the design. But it could take up to uh, a month to prepare the log and another five months to carve the pole. Uh, what we would do is uh, we would start off by, um, uh, you know, shaping the log to the rough shape of the pole. And this could take a long time. Uh, you know, stripping the bark and uh, choosing the right side we're going to carve. Uh, because uh, a lot of the times uh, the cedar has more branches on the, the uh, one side of the tree. So we have to choose which, which side is going to be the front, the face of the pole. The secret of carving a totem pole is to create a sense of depth while actually not even really having that deep of a carving. It's a very monumental style that the Haida people have learned to carve. White says totem poles are more than decoration. They have been a key communication tool for generations. The Haida stories, uh, the family histories, the mythology are what inspire me to create totem poles, sculptures. Each piece I do has a story. Because the Haida did not have a written language, the totem poles served as visual reminders of the stories. So through the oral traditions, the stories could be passed down from generation to generation. Not only the stories from ancient times, but stories that are being created now. 
White is also known for expertise in designing and building traditional Haida canoes. It might take a, a long time to find the, the perfect tree to carve a canoe out of. The person who's gonna carve a, a canoe, they're making a commitment of a long time, a lot of thought. Uh, they're dedicating themselves to creating the canoe. Originally, the canoes were carved in the forest under the cover of the canopy of the forest, the old growth. Um, every step of the way was a, a, there was ceremony involved also. Yeah, uh, this here is the stern of the canoe. Yeah. It's carved out of uh, western red cedar. So I would sit here while I'm steering the canoe and all the paddlers would sit along either side. We built this canoe, uh, we started making this canoe in 1985 and we never finished till about 87. My father was teaching us at the time. On the bow of the canoe, this, this is uh, our lookout. He's, uh, he's watching out for where the canoe is going, kind of a stylized human face in his body. And down back here is the uh, San uh, Orca, our killer whale. If, uh, if somebody is lost at sea, uh, what the people say is uh, the killer whales came to get them and they're taken to the killer whale village where they're transformed into killer whales. The whole canoe is out of one log. Uh, so you see it right here. This canoe has, has not been steamed open yet, but uh, that's how, how it would be shaped uh, before it's steamed open. So just basically out of one, one whole log. So it's a dugout canoe. A way, what makes it a Haida canoe is the steaming process where we widen the canoe out. This is something uh, that was learned over many, many generations. Haida Gwaii is home to an abundance of artists. Christian White believes working on this unique archipelago is an inspiration. Well, I find uh, Haida Gwaii, as an artist, I find it very inspiring. Uh, we have a lot of uh, um, ancient rainforests here. Uh, mountains, uh, many sandy beaches. Uh, I find a lot of inspiration just exploring the islands here. I take my young people that work with me, I take them out into the forest to look at cedars, to look at, uh, uh, I like to show them that there's more to these islands than, than this small little town we're at right now. There's a lot, lot we, we can look at, a lot we can enjoy. That's what, you know, keeps me inspired and uh, it keeps me moving ahead. Christian White believes art will continue to be key in a resurgence in Haida culture on Haida Gwaii. With the resurgence of the arts, it, uh, not only brings in a monetary gain, but also it, there's a resurgent in the, the ceremonialism. And uh, of course, that encourages more art to be created. You know, many people that look at my work and they, they say, well, where is Haida Gwaii? And then it inspires them to come here and to uh, explore our beautiful islands. The northern coastline of Haida Gwaii is a stunning collection of remote landscapes and vibrant Haida culture. Traveling east along Graham Island's marine perimeter, 
one of the region's most recognizable landmarks lies ahead. This is an ANFRD-10 high-frequency direction-finding array. Sixteen of these high-tech systems were built in Canada and the United States during the Cold War. This circular ring of antennae could detect and track the movement of Soviet submarines 5,000 kilometers away. It is known locally as the elephant cage. The ring measures 260 meters in diameter, one of the last visible remnants of a larger military presence here. Further east, the beaches of northern Graham Island are a natural gem. They are sparsely populated, home to an abundance of wildlife and seabird populations. The archipelago was first visited by Europeans in 1774 by Spanish seafarer Juan Perez. Explorer James Cook arrived just four years later, establishing a British presence here. By the mid-19th century, the archipelago was a regular stopping place for American merchants. The British decided to formally establish a colony, naming it the Queen Charlotte Islands. It would be known by this name to the outside world for more than a century. Officially adopting the title Haida Gwaii, or Islands of the People, in 2010. In the distance, the vast landscape of Argonaut Plain suddenly changes. Tow Hill rises 125 meters, a landmark visible from all directions. The hill was formed two million years ago as volcanic rock solidified into basalt pillars. It is surrounded by an ecological reserve, protecting the beaches, dunes, and bogs surrounding Tow Hill. Haida legend treats Toh as a living character, that the hill itself was once located near Masset Inlet. When Toh became angry, he left, settling here on the northern shore of Graham Island. Beyond Toh Hill, more than 10 kilometers of beaches stretch to the northeast.
These beaches have been home to the Haida people for thousands of years. When Europeans first arrived, Haida Gwaii was comprised of 100 thriving villages, home to more than 10,000. But the 19th century proved tragic for the Haida people. Smallpox killed 90% of the population. In the 20th century, the Haida population has stabilized and grown. Today, 45% of residents are Haida. And in the distance lies another scenic Haida landmark. It is Rose Point and Rose Spit beyond. Rose Spit is formed by ocean currents, carrying sand north along Hecate Strait, then depositing it here. The waters are shallow with dangerous currents, making navigation here treacherous. It is the northeastern tip of Graham Island and the closest point on the archipelago to mainland British Columbia. Haida Gwaii's northeasternmost point is a unique geographic location. Rose Spit marks the convergence of two great waterways, Dixon Entrance and Hecate Strait. The Haida called Rose Point Nye and the Sand Spit beyond Nye Coon. It translates to the long nose of Nye. And Rose Spit is part of Nye Coon Provincial Park. Historians say the park is at the heart of the Haida people's traditional territory. My name is Captain Gold. My clan is the Naiku and Kigawai. It is uh, translated into English as those born at House Point. House Point is known on today's charts as Rose Point. Captain Gold believes it is the site of lost villages inhabited by his ancestors. Naikun is the northeast corner of Haida Gwaii, and it's a long sandy spit that reaches out into the Dixon entrance. It's a pretty sandy area all through the location, the sand dunes and windswept. Uh, a lot of uh, wave action upon that uh, coastline and everything. So we used to, uh, at one time there, the people had uh, several different villages. My clan had several different villages along the east coast there, all the way from Nikoon down to Talal. And we probably had a neighborhood of four to five villages, major villages, and big population, especially at Cape Ball. So my clan at one time were very large in population. Years ago, Captain Gold set out to document the history of his people's villages. And I've always heard about the villages that my clan used to live in along the East Coast there, so it's got my interest going. So I, when I became older, I went out when I was in the neighborhood of 20 something years old and started to hike the East Coast looking for the signs of the villages. 
And due to the heavy erosion that goes on on the East Coast from the ocean, from the wind, we, I could not find any signs of the old villages. So I looked out in the intertidal zones and tried to find artifacts that might have eroded out from those banks along the shore, but I did not find anything along there. So it's, even uh, further into the bush and everything else, looking along where I know these locations of the village used to be, I could not find signs of the village also. But the stories were kept alive through oral tradition including Nikun's own story of humankind's creation. A lot of it is in the oral history tradition where we uh, pass the word of the history down through the, um, from one member to another member. One of our interesting stories about the creation time period is when Raven was walking on the mainland and he could hear voices over at uh, Nikun, so he went over there and he found on the Beach, sandy beaches there, clamshell, and inside of it was the boy, tiny voices coming out, so he peeped in there, and he could see the uh, tiny people inside there, and he coaxed them out, and eventually they all came out, and these were the male population. So in order to get the female population, he had gone to some, uh, along the beach and picked out some chitons and placed them upon some of the beings there, so they became the females. So that's an old story, a real old story about the clamshell and Raven taking mankind out of the clamshell. Captain Gold has collected the ancient stories and he studied the archeology span of the region. Now he's trying to bring the two together. I've had a long history of archeology span since around 1974 and I've had a lifetime history of being involved in the Haida culture and the oral history traditions. So I'd, I'd seen nobody who was ever trying to marry together those two, which I thought was so important because uh, when you look at the recorded oral history traditions inside of the ethnology of the Haida from John Swanton and others who came here in 1900s, there's no order in uh, placement of those stories. So I'm trying to piece together oral history tradition with archeology span all through this. He believes the first clue may lie in the location of Toe Hill, a hill Nikun tradition says was moved by divine forces. Gold believes the story may connect to an early glacial period in the region. What I found out anyhow is that in the oral history tradition, the oldest part could possibly be the moving of to a hill. There's two glacial time periods inside of the oral history tradition in the way of uh, the last one that is known began in the neighborhood of 27,000 years ago and ended around 11,000 years ago. The second last one that happened began at 60,000 and ended at around 47,000 years ago. That's the only force that could actually move to a hill. And I figured that it was the beginning point of our oral history tradition. Can't prove it yet, but uh, I'm trying to get science to catch up to all the oral history in that regard. Today, Nikun Provincial Park remains one of Haida Gwaii's scenic wonders. It is located in what is known as the Hecate Depression, a stretch of lowlands set between Haida Gwaii's outer mountains to the west and the coast mountains to the east. The park measures more than 70,000 hectares, comprising Toe Hill, Rose Point, and kilometers of incredible sandy beaches along the east coast of Graham Island. These beaches are a haven for adventurers and explorers. Beachcombers also flock here, seeking unique and interesting finds brought to shore by the unpredictable currents of Hecate Strait.
But in the wake of the tragic Japanese tsunami of 2011, Peter Mark made one find that stood out above all others. I go out to the East Coast there quite often just looking to see what might wash up. Sometimes there's uh, interesting things that come up or just even nice scenery. It's a nice place to go for a drive. I was just driving along on my four-wheeler and I could see I could see the white container from quite a distance, like about two miles away. And as I got closer, I could see that it was the back of a cube van. And uh, when I got up on it, I could see a motorcycle tire sticking out of the back. We all knew that the tsunami debris was on its way. As soon as I uh, got a little closer, I could see that there was a Japanese license plate on the motorcycle. Well, I can't tell you what kind it was. All I know is a Harley Davidson. It was black. It was very beat up by the time it got here. Um, it had been half submerged in salt water, so all the spokes were uh, rusting off, a lot of corrosion on the bike, everything was seized up. And it was be being thrashed around in the container, so it was, it was fairly dented. It just defies all logic that that bike stayed in there. It wasn't tied down. The door was ripped off the container, so it was just, it was open to the elements. All it had to do was take a bad roll, and that bike would have landed on the bottom of the Pacific, somewhere between here and Japan. Peter Mark knew right away his find had to be made public. I knew that was kind of a big deal, that uh, this would probably be the first thing that could be tied directly to the tsunami. And it was fairly remarkable that it made it over in 11 or 12 months. Being in touch with uh, different news agencies, eventually we found out that the owner of the bike actually was alive and had lost everything in the tsunami. And uh, it, it just kind of added a new dimension to everything. All of a sudden there's a, a person attached to the story. And uh, it's remarkable the guy is alive, but uh, at the same time he's lost so much. I mean, he's lost family members, his, his job, his home, everything he owns. Um, it really, uh, really opens your eyes to what happened over there. We haven't actually spoken or written each other as a, a language barrier, but we have um, sent a couple messages back and forth through the news agencies. He had the option to actually have the bike rebuilt and given back to him, and he declined the offer because he, th he just thought it was, it was too much. He, uh, so many of, of his friends and family and everybody else are living in uh, temporary shelters over there, and he just didn't think it was right to spend that much money on a motorcycle, so pretty decent. The coastal region of Nikun Provincial Park is a stunning display of natural beauty. Despite efforts in the early 20th century encouraging settlers to farm here, the region is remote. Today, only tiny settlements remain. Further south, we return to civilization at the communities of Skidigat and Queen Charlotte. This is the major population center for the region. Haida culture is on display everywhere. From museums and art galleries, to the kitchens and backyards of local residents. Pass me the seasoned salt with the red cap, please. Thanks. And the pepper next to it. Roberta Olson is an expert in the culinary traditions of the Haida people. At low tide, it's like there's a banquet set. There's everything that we gather from there that's edible. And we pretty much live off salmon, everything we pick up at low tide. 
I was raised a food gatherer by my parents. And so as I'm getting older, I spend all year gathering. I start in April and go right through till October, November. And it starts off with picking dried seaweed first. And then there's herring roe and kelp that happens later. And then the salmon start arriving and it just goes on and on with gathering food. Olson has become famous for traditional feasts she prepares and serves from her own seaside home. Hey, Mary. Mary. Can you grab me the pars the dill weed and the parsley and put it on here? Put quite a bit on. And then drizzle some parsley on too. I get the phone call and I start gathering and getting organized for it. And there's a lot of a lot of people come from different parts of the world as well as our locals. What's on the menu? This is spring salmon. A lot of people call it king salmon, but we call it spring salmon. And this is halibut. It'll be both fishes will be baked. And then there's venison with wild cranberries, wet herring roe and kelp, and pepper smoked fish and plain smoked fish. After the scallop shell, there'll be a soup we call jum. And I rendered down the halibut bone for the stock, and then there's just onions potatoes and halibut. And on the table, how we usually eat it is with bulletin grease. We call it tau. And then dried seaweed, you sprinkle it in the soup. And that's how we traditionally eat it. And it is not just Olsen. These feasts are a family affair. Today, the countdown is on, with guests soon to arrive. Well, I have um, four grown, grown up children and eight grandchildren and four great, great grandchildren. So that's, um, I do my best to teach them what I'm doing. I take them to the beach with me and berry picking when they're in diapers just to show them. And, and I think when you start with the young ones when they're really young, then it's, it's, um, it works better. If you stay for supper tonight, you'll get an idea what, I'm, what I do. Tonight's guests are students from Smithers, British Columbia. They are about to enjoy a gourmet Haida experience. I just want to welcome you all to my home. It's always an honor to have guests arrive and, and eat what I've gathered and prepared. I was raised a food gatherer by my parents, so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing as I'm getting older. My Haida name is Kinoai. And this is my family. I'm Sylvia. I'm Mary. I'm Krista. I'm Shawnee. So I'll say a prayer. Did you want to sing? Okay. I'll say a prayer in Haida and we'll explain what you're having for supper. Salana, Gatage, Skaurigi, Danga, Kiltlaga, Hawa. Creator, for the food and for you, I thank you. And Hawa is thank you. Olson believes sharing these culinary traditions are important. She says no one ever walks away disappointed. For one thing, it's healthy, it's soul food, it's brain food, all the stuff that we eat has so much going, you know, it's, it's healthy. What else can I say? It's good for the body. What I do makes them happy. I mean, that's all I can explain. I work really hard at doing what I do well, 
like the flavors and the natural and and it just makes people happy to eat what I prepare. From the community of Skidigat, we change course, heading west. Inland, Hecate Strait becomes Maud Channel. Further, the stunning waters of East Narrows and West Narrows follow a winding path through awe-inspiring scenery. To the west, Skidigat Channel divides Graham Island to the north from Moresby Island to the south. And it leads to Cartwright Sound and the open waters of the Pacific. The western coast of Haida Gwaii is truly one of the world's most remarkable stretches of untouched coast. Heading north, following the contours of Graham Island, rocky hills stand alongside dense forests, and pristine islands line the coastal inlets. Haida Gwaii is also home to amazing sea life, including some of British Columbia's largest sea lion colonies. Here at Joseph Rocks, sea lions have been using this as a haul-out site for generations. Set kilometers from the nearest road, it is a spectacle visible only by boat or from the air. Haida Gwaii is home to one-third of BC's sea lion population. They are remarkable creatures, weighing as much as 300 kilograms, some more than two meters long. These sea creatures can live to be 30 years old. Covered in short, thick hair, they inhabit oceans all over the world, from frigid subarctic conditions to the tropics. Beyond Joseph Rocks, Graham Island's northwest coast seems even more remote and more pristine than is even imaginable. Unique geological formations are molded over millions of years. In more sheltered areas, calm pools surround sturdy rock columns and cliff faces make an abrupt halt on approach to land's end.
Just south of Frederick Island, shallow waters stretch for kilometers, with seaweed and tiny pebbles visible in all directions. Next, remote sandy beaches lead to the towering trees of Morgan Point and beyond. And just south of Cape Knox, one stunning island leads to the final chapter of our journey. This is Langara Island, named after the Spanish naval commander Juan de Langara. Langara Point Lighthouse was built here in 1913, one of just two light stations on the archipelago. It is Haida Gwaii's northernmost point, just 45 kilometers south of Alaska, along the Dixon entrance. From the amazing geological formations lining the northern coast of Haida Gwaii, to the cultural stories and stunning beauty of Naikun Provincial Park, to the isolated splendor of Haida Gwaii's western extremity. This northern landscape of Haida Gwaii holds unimaginable beauty. It is serene solitude contained in endless beaches. Untouched natural life along pristine interior waterways. And sea life colonies that will thrive for generations to come. here on the edge of Canada.